Thanks for watching this special program, The Cosmos, Protect, Discover, Transform, brought to you by Paraton. I'm your host, Francis Rose. We have a lot of ground to cover in the next 30 minutes, including how new technology will make communications more effective and improve space exploration, how government can balance innovation and efficiency in space, and the possible impact of Space Policy Directive 4. Some of the field's top experts will join me from NASA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, the U.S. Air Force, Paraton, and Space News. It's a great topic and a great lineup, so let's get started. Joining me first, Phil Liebrecht, Assistant Deputy Associate Administrator for Space Communications and Navigation at NASA. Steve Voltz, Assistant Administrator for Satellite and Information Services at NOAA. Major General Nina Armagno, Director of Space Programs in the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Acquisition at the United States Air Force. And Reggie Brothers, Chief Technology Officer at Paraton. Thanks all very much for joining me. I appreciate it. Phil, I want to start with you. NASA is an R&D agency. Tell me about what you're doing in, in space exploration there. Okay, so NASA, I mean, I think it's general knowledge. We have a broad program of science, exploration, and discovery, and that's what we're all about. Um, and in order to accomplish that, we have missions that start in the Earth's atmosphere, balloons, airplanes, etc., and go all the way up through space stations with humans in it and, and low Earth orbit, all the way through the, the edge of the solar system and beyond. We have two spacecraft now that have left the solar system and are still producing interesting science. Um, so in order to make that happen, um, one of the challenges that we need to deal with at NASA is the communications and navigation challenges. Mm -hmm. And uh, communications, the difficulty of communicating goes up as the square of the distance. Ten times the distance, 100 times harder. So when you, you talk, just to give you a, a simple illustration, uh, like at Pluto, the difficulty in communicating to Pluto is like 10 to the 19 times harder than communicating from your smartphone to a local uh, mobile phone tower. Mm -hmm. So they just give you a, a sense. So a lot of our technology work goes into how can we improve the communications effectiveness, more transfer more data uh, for our ever uh, increasing needs of our science and exploration communities. How can we allow it to happen in a more seamless way so that uh, it's less people power in order to make it happen and, uh, and robots and astronauts can work together as well as scientists uh, in, a, in a seamless way? And also how to uh, navigate uh, more effectively all across the solar system, but especially uh, we spend a lot of energy working uh, near the Earth. Mm -hmm. we, we use GPS to navigate our spacecraft, uh, similar to the way people use GPS to navigate to a, a new restaurant or a new shopping mm -hmm. center or what have you. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're, we're spending a lot of energy pushing that out, that capability out. We know how to do it very well uh, near the Earth and low Earth orbit. Uh, we have pushed it out um, beyond uh, 12 Earth radii at this point and are learning how to do it, trying to to learn how to do it out at the moon mm -hmm. in the lunar environment using GPS. So, I'd Steve, I think a lot of people do not understand the size and the comprehensiveness of the satellite fleet that NOAA operates. Tell me about the scope of that fleet, the kinds of things that you do, and maybe the kinds of things that you can do now that you didn't when the fleet uh, was not uh, of the size and capacity that it is today. Well, uh, that's a great question. Um, the, the scope of the fleet is really commensurate with the scope of the mission. So we have a, everybody in the U.S., everybody, and largely, in fact, most of the people in the world are customers for what NOAA does. NOAA, our observations, our, our, our responsibility is to deliver information, forecasts, and warnings to everybody in the United States 24-7, every day of the year, without interruption, forever. So to do that you, requires observations on a global scale of the planet. And uh, um, so we have multiple satellites in what we call low Earth orbit, which are orbiting the planet every 90 minutes or thereabouts. We are operating actually 18 satellites in orbit right now, of which, and we also operate the defense, the satellites for the Defense Department's weather service as well. About half of those provide that low Earth orbit view, which is looking in many different bands, many different uh, aspects at the environment. They look at the air, the water, the land, and they take all those data and they beam them down to the Earth on a regular basis, usually when they go over the poles. Um, and that's half of it. The other half of what we do, in addition to that 
information which goes into numerical weather modeling is we have geostationary satellites which sit over, we have two of them sitting over east coast and over west coast, we call them goes east and goes west, great names. <laughs> um, and what they have is, is zero latency effectively, five minute latency from an observation to information to the user. So they're staring and particularly effective when you have major storm events like tornado outbreaks across the Midwest. With the geostationary satellites, you watch it grow, you watch it formulate, create, and we watch it march across highway to highway, city to city. And with that five minute latency, that information set, we, we beam the data down and it goes directly to those communities as it's happening and not the next day and not in the evening forecasts. Mm -hmm. So what we're experiencing right now is, is to provide that, that suite of instruments and satellites, it's not something you do overnight. Mm -hmm. We've been doing this for about 40 years and it takes a generation, really, a human generation to conceive, create, deploy, and exploit a satellite constellation like that. And we're just now, in the last two years, on the transition from one generation to the next. We just, we've launched in the last two years three satellites, one low Earth orbit and two geostationary, which are really a, a, a leap forward in technology over what we've had in the past. And just to give an example, the geostationary satellite has three times the number of spectral bands. It looks at the phenomenon on three different channels of, of information. Four times the resolution. So instead of eight kilometer pixel size of a picture on the Earth, it's one or two kilometers. And five times, five times the speed. So it take a hemispherical picture of the Earth, instead of doing it every 30 minutes, it can do it every five minutes. And in some places we have 30 second updates. So imagine a picture of a storm and you see it every five minutes or every 15 minutes, it's kind of, you see it snap, 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 mm -hmm. and that's one image. Now imagine with 30 second updates and you can actually see the dynamics, the atmospheric dynamics, the atmospheric ground interactions in a way that you never could before. That's really changing the way that we view phenomena in a visual way, in a, a, gut, a gut way, mm -hmm. so you can sort of realize the impact of it much more, act, much more realistically, much more um, concurrently with the events. It's, so the real challenge we have, technology challenge, now that we've launched this generation of upgrades, is how to deal with it. Mm -hmm. The data rate is orders of magnitude higher than before. Interpreting that by the, the experts is very difficult, mm -hmm. let alone the civilians. So getting all that, figuring out how to titrate that information set, how to merge it and, and turn observations into information is the challenge that we face as an agency, the data and information service that we have, to turn data into information in the way that it can be received effectively. I want to come back to that when we get a chance, but General Armano, I noticed as he was talking about the fact that this takes a generation to bring a new satellite online, you were nodding very enthusiastically. <laughs> Tell me about the strategy that's involved with acquiring and putting something up into the air. Well, our, our current strategy is is evolving, and I'm really excited to, to see what we're what we're about. Uh, the reason I was nodding vigor vigorously uh, is because our satellites today are uh, I mean, when they're built in a factory, they're they're literally handmade, mm -hmm. literally with tools like tweezers. And a factory is a, is a satellite sitting on a stand and people come to it rather than a conveyor belt, if you will. So I was resonating with this thought that it takes a generation. Mm -hmm. So uh, today's Air Force is, uh, and, and the way we're looking at acquisition, we have to field uh, tomorrow's capabilities faster and smarter. Mm -hmm. And we're doing just that in many ways, starting with the strategy. So we know that we are the best in the world at what we do. America is the best in the world in space, and our adversaries know it. Mm -hmm. Very specifically, Russia and China, by the year 2025, they will be able to threaten all of our capabilities in every orbital regime. That's the low Earth orbit, the medium Earth orbit, the geosynchronous Earth orbit, highly elliptical, you name it. Our capabilities uh, will be threatened by our peers, uh, uh, this is a peer competition we're entering. Mm -hmm. And so our strategy is to look at space as an enterprise rather than in the stove pipes mm -hmm. uh, that our ancestors basically uh, have built and acquired, operated, maintained, and sustained our systems. Now we have to look at an enterprise view. Reggie, connect the dots here from what you've what you've heard from sure. your fellow panelists, both with your experience at DHS, your experience inside the Pentagon, mm -hmm. and now what you're seeing in the private sector. How does all of this connect together, Reggie? Yeah, it's interesting. Um, so one of the things uh, General Manu just mentioned was this the threat, mm -hmm. right? One of the things we were talking about earlier were these other. Uh, 
NOT EMISSIONS, FOR EXAMPLE, AND THE NEED FOR uh, VERY INSTANT WEATHER INFORMATION, RIGHT? Part of the problems of all these is what? Is communications. Mm -hmm. But how do we make sure we have these the kind of, kind of communications so we can get the information that we need from one place to another to the decision maker? You mentioned decisions, how we get to the decision makers that we need when they need that information. Mm -hmm. One way to think about this, and again, I'm going to quote your words, has to do with an enterprise architecture. That really has to do with how do you think about not just what you have in space, but what you have subterrestrially, what you have in fiber. What do you have RF? What do you have optically? These different modalities of communication that we, we can think about as an entire enterprise. Then the question becomes, how do you optim optimally allocate that enterprise dynamically with time, mm -hmm. right? And dy dynamically with space as well. So I want to come back to that in the next part of our conversation, but very yeah. quickly to wrap up, Reggie, what, what's the big architecture need for that synchronous communication? So one of the challenges is just the control of this, mm -hmm. right? How are we going to think about the different needs of the different users different layers of constellations, how are these synchronized with respect to mission need, with respect to priorities, with respect to time? And I think a lot of that, there are different programs that are looking at how do you do these kinds of controls, whether it's autonomous or hybrid, man in the loop kind of uh, control. That's, I think, a big challenge we have. The space professionals developing futuristic tech like software radios and optical lasers also need to worry about very grounded issues like budgets. Up next, how government can balance innovation and efficiency. You're watching The Cosmos. Protect, discover, transform on the Government Matters Thought Leadership Network. Keep it right here. The Cosmos. Protect, discover, transform is brought to you by Paraton, a next generation national security company. For more information, go to Periton.com. Government Matters, exploring trends in the federal community. Join Francis Rose as he covers the business of government six days a week, weeknights at 8 and 11 p.m. on WJLA 24-7 News and Sundays at 10.30 a.m. on ABC7. Welcome back to this special program, The Cosmos, Protect, Discover, Transform, brought to you by Paraton. I'm your host, Francis Rose. Speed is essential if the national security and defense communities want to meet the challenges that space poses. Here, our panel explains the challenge of meeting that mission head on and delivering on efficiency. Here again, Phil Liebrecht, Assistant Deputy Associate Administrator for Space Communications and Navigation at NASA. Steve Voltz, Assistant Administrator for Satellite and Information Services at NOAA. Major General Nina Armagno, Director of Space Programs in the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Acquisition at the Air Force. And Reggie Brothers, the Chief Technology Officer at Periton. Phil, what resonated in what Reggie talked about a moment ago about communications? Well, a lot. I mean, uh, you know, there's tremendous new technologies that are becoming available now that NASA and many other organizations and industry and government are are pursuing and a few examples are like optical communications which just will break the bandwidth uh, barriers of what we've had in the past with smaller, smaller lighter, uh, um, much lower power terminals that'll, that'll transmit gigabits and tens of gigabits, maybe even more than that uh, around in space. Um, other uh, things that are needed in order to make the system more transparent and more uh, seamless in an operational sense, more automated, um, space inter-networking capabilities that will allow us to extend what we do on the Earth and seamlessly go into space with that. Yeah. Ultimately, in NASA's case, across the solar system. Yeah. Um, but, but nonetheless, I mean, it'll, it'll allow that seamless connectivity then into the, into the Earth's uh, space yeah, inter-networking infrastructure, mm -hmm. which will, you know, allow uh, effective, efficient things to happen. And, and then a lot of other things that would help with automation. So there's a, there's a number of uh, capabilities there. One of the key ones is where I started with navigation. There are multiple things there, but GPS can navigate us. With, our spacecraft can do it on its own. Steve's latest GO spacecraft uses this high altitude GPS as an example to navigate mm -hmm. uh, and very, uh, very rapidly understands where it is and that allows that data to go more quickly into a usable form. Mm -hmm. Tell me, Steve, about what you need infrastructure-wise to achieve what we're talking about on mm -hmm. the program and what you have right now, what the kind of the gap maybe isn't a fair word, but it's the best one I can think of. Uh, so, uh, sure, and I, I want to resonate with something Reggie said about the, inter, the, uh, the necessity of the backbone. I see communications as a service. Mm -hmm. 
So when you think about all these different data sets, these different observations to get it to the user, what we really are seeing as the sort of the, the great leap forward they're going to be able to make with our new satellites and all the other information that's available is making the information interoperable and integratable. So it's not so much make sure that every satellite is 100% reliable forever, but that you can draw on different sources of information in near real time so that the user doesn't care whether it came from satellite A or B or C. They want to know the information is secure and reliable and dependable and that it's placed in the right kind of context. So that the backbone of great communications and also the reach back into the archives, into the information content that places a new observation in context is really essential in, in providing the greatest value. It's not just a picture, but is this picture different from what it was yesterday? Mm -hmm. is, it, is it changing in real time? So if you're looking for floods or non-floods, JPSS is a constellation we just flew. I can take a great picture of the land with this joint polar satellite system, but it's a picture of trees and water and rocks. If I then immediately or near real time draw on what did it look like over the past years, I can see there's water where it wasn't. Mm -hmm. The trees have been damaged. Mm -hmm. I can do a changed dynamic effect and observation in near real time, which allows me then to see much more important, what has changed and what do I have to respond to, not just is it a pretty picture. If we had time, I want to come yeah. back to yeah. the implications of that because it sounds massive. Reggie. Yeah, yeah. I want to follow up on second because I, I think you raise a really good point, and this has got to do with this this cloud, this backbone, right? And we talk a lot about cloud when we think about IT mm -hmm. infrastructure these days, and, or on, uh, terrestrially. But I think when we start thinking about that same type of structure in space. In fact, going back to this whole idea of looking at the entire enterprise, whether it's spaceborne or terrestrial, as that that is our information cloud environment. Mm -hmm. Then the question is, you bring up automation, right? Well, we've got technologies that we're talking about, artificial intelligence, for example. Mm -hmm. How do we leverage these kind of technologies in the best way so that as we have this overarching cloud, we can then do the right kind of messaging formats. You met, you were talking about different types of messages, for example, right? We need to have these unifying architectures that allow us to bring different messaging formats, communications protocols, and the, and the like together mm -hmm. so that, again, it gets back to the bottom line question of how do you get the right information to the right person at the right time. So, General, I'll, I want to come back to okay. you in a moment, Steve, but I want to ask the General, we're, we're talking about, you, you mentioned innovation in the first part of our conversation, how important it is to move innovation up the chain as quickly as possible. What does that look like in the kind of environment that your fellow panelists are talking about, ma'am? Uh, may I first say that when I hear uh, communication and I hear open architecture, I, from a warfighting perspective, think command and control. Mm -hmm. I think multi-domain command and control because that is what the future joint force uh, needs. Uh, the future fight will be all domain. Air, land, sea, yes. Space and cyber as well. Mm -hmm. And a commander who's making decisions needs to uh, have information coming from all of those domains and then be able to command and control uh, whatever kind of weapons or sy systems are in all those domains. Mm -hmm. And now to get to your uh, innovation uh, question. Um, I think innovation is really the essence of, of what we're talking about here. Mm -hmm. uh, in uh, the acquisition uh, world, in, in the acquisition, from the acquisition perspective, uh, we know we have to acquire things faster, smarter. We've been giving, we've been given authorities from Congress to go faster. We've, we've been given uh, rapid prototyping and rapid fielding authorities. Uh, well, how do we do that when we're used to acquiring systems using the, using the DOD 5000 process, which is, uh, you know, traditionally laborious, almost linear, you know, it, it, it takes a while, and, and actually that, that was put in place for reasons in the past. Uh, but to go faster, we got to capitalize on, on these authorities, but we also have to be innovative. We have to work with industry. We have to talk with our civil partners here. We all have to be in this together. It's about partnership. It's about thinking creatively and moving forward together quickly. We have just time for a lightning round from everybody. We're running out of time. So I want to start with you, Phil. I want each of you to tell me how the most important thing you've seen about the evolution of this space, no pun intended, in the last five years or so, and what you expect to see, what you expect to be the most important thing that you'll see in the coming half decade. Go ahead. So I think the technology uh, in particular, LaserCom has just been phenomenal in the last five years. I think the other phenomena that, that the general just alluded to is the partnerships, which I think is that's going to explode. It, there's always been a lot. There's going to be a lot more. Steve? 
I think the change in uh, technology availability, and uh, to what the, again to what General and, and uh, what I was just saying, is that you have to be able to innovate in without dictating. Uh, the older model of defining the specification and telling everybody exactly what to do doesn't work when most of the investment and most of the innovation is coming from outside the government sector. So being able to work in an open format and learn from industry and adapt our systems, whether they're procurement or exploitation systems, to take advantage of those is going to be the essential nature of expanding our capabilities. General? Uh, 30 years ago when I began my career as a second lieutenant, a task that would take me about 30 minutes to kind of laboriously work through with, you know, pen and paper. Uh, well, we can now do with a click of a button. And uh, so I see technology being a, a great friend to uh, military space. Reggie? Uh, the same thing. Um, I think you start looking at some of the proposals that are coming out, whether it be SpaceX, Telesat, OneWeb, these kinds of things. I think we're going to see a, a proliferation of these kinds of um, aspirational systems. And I think what we'll find is there'll be a greater use of the national uh, security um, enterprise using these things and trying to integrate them with their mission sets. Reggie, General, Steve, Phil, thanks all very much for joining me. I appreciate it very much. Up next, one of the deans of space journalism, Sandra Irwin, on what we've learned today, the impact of Space Policy Directive 4 and more. You're watching The Cosmos, protect, discover, transform on the Government Matters Thought Leadership Network. The Cosmos, protect, discover, transform is brought to you by Periton a next-generation national security company. For more information, go to Periton.com. Government Matters, exploring trends in the federal community. Join Francis Rose as he covers the business of government six days a week, weeknights at 8 and 11 p.m. on WJLA 24-7 News and Sundays at 10.30 a.m. on ABC7. Space Policy Directive 4 established a U.S. Space Force as the sixth branch of the armed forces. It's designed to operate across the spectrum of conflict. It's an exciting and controversial development in some quarters. Let's dig into some of the implications now. Sandra Irwin is a staff writer at Space News. Sandra, thanks for coming on. What's your reaction to what you just heard, the panel conversation that we uh, had a moment ago? So Francis, there's a number of things that I got from that panel. The number one thing is the enormous dependence that we have as a country, as a society on space. I mean, if you listen to what they talked about, they talked about science, mm -hmm. exploration, an essential thing that we do in space. Weather services, you can talk about navigation services, you can talk about so many things that the, the entire global economy depends on for space. So mm -hmm. that, that is a huge thing. And of course, we heard the national security implications from General Armagno, which are very significant. And mm -hmm. she made a very compelling argument that we are at the point that if we don't do something, Russia and China are going to be able to challenge all of our capabilities in space from all the different orbits and that is, that is a pretty uh, com compelling statement to make and something that I think the Air Force has been concerned for a long time and they're trying to do something to pre prevent that situation from happening. The manifestation of that through the Trump administration is Space Policy Directive 4 that establishes a space force to operate within the Air Force similar to the Navy and Marine Corps model. Tell me what we know about that moving forward and what the Air Force has said about how they intend to stand that up how it will be uh, powered and the kinds of people that will be moving there. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the president, uh, when, when he signed Space uh, Policy Directive 4, it really, th that's just only the intent. Mm -hmm. That's only a document that says, DOD, go to Congress and submit a proposal and submit a budget, and now let's see what Congress does. So I think there's probably some misunderstanding. People think that the Space Force is a done deal. Mm -hmm. It is not. So that on, on the one side. Um, now it's going to be up to DOD to go to Congress and sell this plan. It's not going to be easy. It's, been, it's very political. It's going to be a political battle. We don't necessarily, we have not necessarily heard from a lot of members of Congress how they intend to vote, but the sense is that they're going to want to ask a lot of questions. They're 
going to wait until they see all the details, not just the cost, but also the uh, other, other issues like personnel issues are going to be huge. Are they going to make people transfer from the Army or the Air Force to the Space Force? And what if people don't want to do that? Mm -hmm. So that's going to create some, some issues for, for DOD going forward. So they, they, have a, they have a big job ahead trying to sell this to, to Congress. One of the things I didn't get a chance to talk about as much as I'd like with General Armagno was this concept of innovation and what it actually looks like today in the space and satellite field. As you go out and cover these issues on an everyday basis, what kind of innovations do you see? What are things that are possible today that weren't a short time ago? Or what are things that will be possible soon that maybe are not possible or just beginning to be possible today, Sandra? Well, I, I think that the challenges that General Armani has highlighted, those are things that potentially there is technology available to go and address these problems. You know, she talked about the, the, the threats in space, that our satellites are being challenged by anti-satellite weapons, by electronic weapons. So now there's, for example, small satellites available that are cheap, that they can be, that can be launched very quickly. And so instead of having these expensive satellites that if one goes down, then the entire capability goes down. They can actually have much more resilient systems using small satellites, using small launch vehicles. Of course, that requires a change in the whole process, in the whole acquisition mindset, and that's not necessarily easy to do, and she mentioned that. Mm -hmm. But it is, there is technology available to have more resiliency in space. That's a big one. Of course, you know, they mentioned data, having seamless data integration and communication. That is something that in the industry now is rapidly moving to advance those those types of technologies you can actually now you have Amazon setting up a cloud-based ground station service so people can actually hook up their satellites to the Amazon ground stations and manage data that way I mean that's that is a, that is a significant innovation that is happening and it's going to make space not just more innovative and more innovative industry but also just uh, so much more, uh, so, so, much, so, much, so many more uh, capabilities that the national security agencies that DOD can actually bring into the government. So you're laying out something that's kind of a concept that I heard in between the lines of what the people on the panel were talking about, and that is space has the potential, not just from a national security perspective, but from a commercial perspective, a, an economic perspective, to become tremendously much more competitive 5, 10, 25 years from now than it is today. What are the implications of that with a lot of different competitors, some of them maybe with not the best of intentions or the best view of the United States? What does that mean, do you think, overall, for people like the practitioners that we heard from in the first part of our program? From F from a, from an innovation and technology perspective, it's all good. There's a lot of a lot of innovation, a lot of investment. You see China. I mean, China is viewed as a rival, but look at what China is doing. They achieved very remarkable things in space. Last year alone, 18 um, sorry, in 2018, 38 launches. They're actually developing their own GPS constellation or a comparable constellation to GPS. They're going to be launching their own Chinese space station. So those, those are very compelling things that they're doing. So from that standpoint, innovation is a good thing. Of course, that puts the United States in a position that, so what if China is going to catch up to the US? What does it mean for us? And that means what you heard from the general, that the US has to step up its game, that you have to have satellites that are resilient, constellations that are resilient. You have to have well-defended capabilities, so you send the message to China that it's not worth even messing around with the U.S. Uh, with the U.S. space systems. Sandra Irwin of Space News, thanks very much for joining me. I appreciate it. Thank you it. for having me. And thank you for watching this special program, The Cosmos, Protect, Discover, Transform. For more information on the subject matter we talked about today, go to govmatters.tv slash paraton. For the Government Matters Thought Leadership Network, I'm Francis Rose.